Making RPGs is not a zero-sum game. You can work with people who are publishing very different things, and that's not competition, and sort of drop a little bit of the hostile rivalry attitudes you have seen on social media and stuff. I think that can be really good. Hello, salut, bonjour. Welcome to The Lost Bay, a show about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. I'm Iko. Today, my guest is Ayan Newsom, designer of the Mothership RPG Adventures, Moonbase Blues, Picket Line Tango, and The Drain. Ayan's writing style and adventures are punchy. If I could sum up their qualities in one word, I would say that punchy. Every bit of them, every sentence, every word contributes strongly to the creation of the adventures and their uncanny mood. Ian also runs a great blog called Uncanny Spheres, where he writes with a lot of honesty about his experience as an indie RPG designer. In a few moments, we'll talk about all that, but first, here is how Ian stumbled upon RPGs during a difficult moment of his life. I dropped out of college when I was about 20 and was struggling with some mental health stuff. <clears throat> and was just sort of listlessly floating through life, took like, you know, odd jobs, seasonal jobs. Like I worked at a summer camp. I worked for a landscaper, stuff like that. And I was just trying to find things to do. And I heard about Critical Role. And I was like, I don't know. I'm into weird fantasy stuff. I'm into to nerdy stuff. So I, I gave that a listen. And it seemed all right. I uh, I think Critical Role is sort of a weird w way to get into RPGs. It's a very different experience of playing games than how I play games now, you know. Um, and then I went and sought out games. And again, the first thing and the only thing that I found was Roll20. And they have these looking for game forums which are an absolute nightmare uh, of an experience. You have to like look through dozens of dozens of people posting like two sentence descriptions of games with no punctuation, then apply to play in them. And there's like hundreds of people like glomming onto every person who wants to run a game. So that was my first experience with RPGs was playing in these really bad fifth edition D and D games on roll 20. So after the disappointing experience with Roll20, I had found the indie RPG community on Google+, Plus just a few months before the social network stopped its activity. Uh, I did catch it before it died because I made a lot of awesome friends, a lot of really cool game designer friends like Fiona Geist and Jarrett Crater and Christian Kessler, who work on awesome stuff, played in their games, which absolutely blew my mind how cool and amazing they were. And I've been playing games like that with, you know, those people and then the broader, you know, OSR, post OSR indie RPG community since then. So you, you've been playing mainly online, right? Or exclusively online, other than Gen Con 2019, where I got to meet a lot of these uh, friends I made online and play games with them. And that was awesome. I guess so. Yeah. I wasn't around during the Google Plus days, but I can relate so much with the idea that the RPG experience is made not only by the game itself, but by the people you play with or more broadly, the people you interact with. Yeah. I mean, because I've gone through very different stages of how I interact with RPGs. I think what they have meant to me, you know, in a like mentally fulfilling, mentally healing way has changed. I mean, 
when I first started playing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, the games weren't particularly good, but it was still a revelation to be able to express creativity in that way. And it did bring a lot of, you know, meaning into my life. When I actually found like a meaningful community, that was, you know, one of the best experiences of my life, I think. Um, you know, I found people who were like me, uh, broadly leftist in ideology and, you know, in a more tangible sense, like cared about each other and wanted to support each other and, you know, were just amazingly intelligent and creative and, you know, it was incredible. Post Google Plus, now I'm in this other weird stage where a lot of these communities have fractured and are more diffuse and it's sort of harder to connect with people in some ways. Now that I'm getting into game design, I'm having less and less time to actually play games and just run games for the joy of them. So I don't know, my relationship to, to games now is just work 24 seven. So it's very different. I think game design is the most fulfilling work thing I've ever done, certainly. And it's incredibly meaningful to me to do it. But it doesn't have the same just unbridled joy of community and, and a creative experience that it did when I was just sort of discovering the possibility of playing awesome games with cool people. How did you start like designing for others? I mean, how did that start? Yeah, it started with just running games with a, and playing games with people who design games. The first actual work I ever got was my good friend Fiona Geist. From Exalted Funeral? From Exalted Funeral, editor of Silent Titans, Mothership, you know, a million, a million RPG books. She recommended me to Sean McCoy to write a pamphlet adventure, which is not yet published. Anyway, I wrote a thing and I got to have the experience of, you know, getting feedback on it and, you know, really working at something to polish up to another level and another level and play testing it and play testing it. And uh, that was something, you know, really different from just sort of casually running games. And it was a really useful experience to work with people who were operating on such a high professional level like Sean and, and Fiona. Um, so after this first adventure, which is not yet published, Ian released Moonbase Blues. It's a pamphlet adventure and packed onto only one sheet of paper. There is a strong setting that involves a mysterious meteor and an epidemic of madness on a small and remote moon. Moonbase Blues happened when a community member from who played Mothership just randomly shot me over a layout spread that he had done taking my blog post scenario and laying it out into a, a single page dungeon. And I thought, wow, that's really awesome. He just wanted to get permission to post it on the internet. I was totally cool with that. But then we got to talking about it a little more and we decided to put some more work into it, you know, add another page of content to it and, and play test it and develop it and take it seriously and flesh this out into a pamphlet scenario. You know, I've gone from there. I climbed a ladder of friendships and connections to work with as many different people as I can and, and do all these cool collaborations and, and put out cool things. Little after releasing Moonbase Blues, Ian was involved in Dissident Whispers, a community RPG book published in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. This 100 plus pages book was completed in just 10 days and was designed by an international team of 90 authors and creators. At the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, I followed on Twitter something from someone I'd never met who had like 40 followers saying, hey, I want to make some sort of collaborative zine to raise money for bail funds. So I signed up and there was about 100 other people that joined. And it's kind of incredible how we even did it, but we made a book in 10 days. We made a 140 page book from start to finish in 10 days. Organizing a team of 90 contributors online in such a short time is not an easy feat. And Ian found quickly himself joining the team in charge of the coordination effort. 
in the beginning of Dissonant Whispers, when there were just a bunch of people piling into a Discord server, it's very chaotic. People were just throwing out suggestions for organization. And my now great friend, one of my best friends, uh, Eric Cahill, who thought of the whole concept and created the server and, and ran the helped run the project, would take these suggestions and just, you know, do things. Things would just happen. Gradually, we realized that some people were a little more interested in the organizational aspects or maybe had a little more experience with the organizational aspects. We split the server up into people who are just contributing and, quote, helpers who are effectively project organizers. Helpers had private channels uh, where we would coordinate information we created workflows for writers to submit, pair up with artists, pair up with layout, get their content edited. You know, in an organization that's that large, it would take weeks of effort making sure that everyone could agree on something and, and we're all on the same page. But we were extremely motivated by current events to really make things happen. I mean, it was a moral push to move quickly. And among the helpers were people like Eric, uh, myself, Sean McCoy, who came on to take a incredibly meaningful role in helping get this thing done. He eventually agreed to publish the thing under TKG and was, you know, Sean McCoy is a huge reason why this was even possible. That's really cool. And what, what was like the hardest part of it for you? I mean, uh, honestly, the, the doing it wasn't hard. Uh, or it was hard, but it was so rewarding and so incredible at the time. It, you know, it was, I had like, you know, limitless energy and it was, it was great. The hard part was afterwards. The hard part was coming down. It was such an adrenaline high, such a marathon of, of work. The hard part was just dealing with the aftermath. It was a struggle in the, the, the weeks and months of postpartum depression and anxiety and, and all that stuff. It's absolutely amazing that Dissident Whisper has been designed not only in 10 days, but in the middle of the COVID-19 epidemic. I've been playing RPGs for a long time, but I discovered the indie post-OSR ecosystem only a few months ago. So I keep wondering what effect the pandemic and its various lockdowns and quarantines might have had on the indie RPG scene. Here's I and thoughts about that. If I could identify anything, it would be more people are giving publishing a shot and making things. Because that's happening and just because of social changes, maybe not necessarily specifically because of COVID, just generally, you know, sociopolitical consciousness, people are taking collective organization efforts uh, and just sort of labor consciousness is, is becoming more of a discussed issue. One of the most politically useful things that we can do as a industry is to be open about how much we're making, how much we are charging uh, for work. I think that that needs to be widely understood so that people know how much to charge, aren't being taken advantage of, and can have a living wage. In my experience in indie publishing stuff, most publishers are paying around 10 cents a word. And then people who want to pay well or, you know, are running a Kickstarter where they can, you know, afford to pay people a little well because they're making the money up front uh, will pay around 15 cents. 15 cents a word is a really good rate, you know, that I've, I've heard. But I've also heard, you know, up to 20 cents or 25 cents. That's more getting in the realm of what I would consider, you know, a livable wage is sort of that area. If you can afford to pay people these numbers that I'm talking about, you should. Lately, there's been a public discussion about what should be fair wages for writer and artists. And voices from different areas, from different regions, have expressed their feelings about this issue. But is a fixed rate per word really the best way to quantify the amount of work produced by writers? Particularly given the kind of games that I work in um, and the sort of formats that I write in, word count isn't really that representative of the effort that goes into it. 
when I'm writing a pamphlet adventure that's like 1500 words, it's still an adventure. I mean, I, I am, it's a lot of information edited way down, packed way down, condensed to the, the minimal word count her meaning. It's really a lot of work. It's not the same thing as just turning in a longer form, more traditional like D&D adventure where you're just writing paragraphs of room description, paragraphs and paragraphs. And, you know, you might fill up four pages just to describing one location where it might be described as usefully in a shorter form zine or a pamphlet adventure in, you know, a couple sentences or something. So I really think that 15 cents a word should be the minimum standard and generally kickstarting something people should be paid higher because you're making a lot more money you're you're getting the money up front from from creators you're mentioning kickstarter I feel like for now it's like the only way for super indie or indie publishers to to be able to guarantee a minimum budget for the project and therefore like minimum wages, I would say maybe unfortunately, it's the only way for now. What do you think about that? I just launched a new zine called Picket Line Tango. Uh, it is a 16 page mothership zine. It is the first zine length thing that I have published. Everything else has been a pamphlet. And I did it outside of Kickstarter. I tried my best to promote it places leading up to the launch, during the launch, and I'm currently losing money on the project. I I paid people good rates because these are all my friends. I want to pay them well. You know, oh, I want everyone to feel good about working on it and want to work with me again. So I ended up spending, including printing costs, $1,800 on it. And I, I did all of the editing myself. I developed it. I edited it. I hired uh, Fiona Geist for proofreading. You know, I did art direction. I published it. I marketed it and all this stuff. And I think right now I'm maybe $300 in the red uh, down. And the only reason I'm, I, I'm even... And that close to breaking even is because um, I've sold a bunch of physical copies wholesale to places like um, Tuesday Night Games. It's very difficult as an indie publisher, at least in my experience, to make much money, at least in the short term outside of Kickstarter. I think in the extreme long term, maybe in a year, I will be compensated for the work that I, I put into Picket Line Tango. But particularly if you're, you know, sort of living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, you know, it's not very sustainable to put out something and, and not make your money back uh, within the first month of sales. Um, so that was Picket Line Tango, a project funded without Kickstarter. Now Ian is going to talk about The Drain, another mothership adventure which is funded through Kickstarter. And here are the financial details about it. The Drain is a Kickstarter that I ran for Zine Quest 3, which is also a 16-page mothership zine, and that raised $15,000. That's 10 times the amount of money. There's a lot of trade-offs there. I mean, it's, it's not just, well, Kickstarter makes you 10 times the money, because Kickstarter also involves an incredible amount of work. You know, The Drain, at this point, has eaten basically half a year of my life, you know, when you sum all of the hours spent working last year and this year, it's probably about half a year working full time. I've made $15,000 from the Kickstarter minus, you know, costs, Kickstarter fees and all that. Uh, about $1,000 from taking pre-orders and add-ons from the pledge manager. And then I have retail agreements with several retailers lined up. And that is another couple thousand dollars coming to me. Probably by the end of this year, after all costs, I will have made maybe $10,000, maybe $15,000 profit for half a year's work, which, you know, obviously isn't horrible, but it's not a living wage either. Um, if you're going to be doing indie publishing, it's really a long term prospect. You really have to expect to not make a lot of money until you have a huge roster of things selling and a reputation and a lot of people following your work and, you know, 
maybe a website, maybe a newsletter, maybe, you know, a, a company, basically, somehow. Yeah, a company. There are other ways to raise money for TTRPGs, and each funding is one of them. Each funding is a way to use the distribution platform itch.io to fund games like Kickstarter, but not like Kickstarter, in maybe a less stressful and more human way. But until now, the projects funded via each funding have raised smaller budgets than the Kickstarter one. And that might change in the future. And speaking of future, I often wonder how the indie TTRPG scene is going to evolve in the next years. Here's Zion about a possible future for the post OSR scene. Um, it's hard to predict because I'm looking at just like the tip of the iceberg of the tabletop RPG scene. You know, I think RPGs and even indie RPGs are sort of by nature fairly balkanized because there's all these different systems and stuff. So I don't think this current surge is going to go away. I think that it will continue just taking shots in the dark. It, we could see something like a gentrification of the indie scene where smaller creators become medium sized creators and then who are still making the art punk or a, adjacent sort of aesthetic that people like out of the smaller creators, but are doing it at a professional enough level that it drowns out the production quality and output capacity of smaller creators. So you could see something where uh, it's harder to get in. So that was the pessimistic hypothesis, now the more optimistic one. You know, I think that there is more of a class consciousness sort of growing in the indie scene that is leading to these, you know, small bands of people getting together and doing cool things and teaming up and doing collective action. My utopic dream for the indie RPG scene is all these people start banding together in small groups in their own little sub scenes, but then the sub scenes start talking to one another. Sounds cool, right? What's about to follow is even better, even more exciting. Making RPG is not a zero sum game. You can work with people who are publishing very different things, and that's not a competition, and sort of drop a little bit of the hostile rivalry attitudes you have seen on social media and stuff, I think that can be really good. There needs to be some way to communicate between groups. I mean, in the past, you've had these divides that are now kind of, I think, melting away about like, OSR versus story games, you know, and the people who play a certain kind of game don't really know a lot about another kind of game or people who publish for a certain kind of game maybe don't know what it's like to publish for another kind of game. So my dream would be people talking more and people getting together and saying, all right, well, here's some people who publish a lot of stuff for old school essentials, third party. Uh, we're going to go and get a bunch of people from the mothership community. And then we're also going to get some story gamers and some lyric games people. And we're just going to have a panel and, and talk and, and plan things. I don't know. I think that maybe that's unrealistic, but that, that would be my hope. That was Ian Newsom, designer of The Adventures, Moonbase Blues, Picket Line Tango, and The Drain. In the show notes, you'll find links to Ian's Ichayo page where you can download his games and to his blog, Uncanny Spheres. The Lost Bay is a podcast about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. It's produced by me, Iko, and music is by Every Eyes. If you want to get in touch or get news about the podcast, you can find me on Twitter at The Lost Bay. Thank you so much for listening and salut, à bientôt.